Good evening. First, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival. Good evening. First, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgements. Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival is hosted on the unceded land of the Piscataway, Lumbee, and Cherokee peoples. We organize on the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway people, now known as present day Baltimore. We wish to pay our respects to the elders, past and present citizens of the Cedarville Band of the Piscataway Kanoi, the Piscataway Indian Nation, and the Piscataway Kanoi Tribe. We strive to hold space and value the perspectives that these nations share regarding their histories, culture, and traditions. As we build community and sovereign nations to ensure reconciliation on their rightful land, we encourage our attendees to learn more about the Piscataway by going to piscatawayindians.com. Hi, I'm Imani Castillo. Thank you for joining us uh, for the first 100% um, virtual Black Femme Supremacy Film Festival, a film festival intentionally for Black Femmes, meaning including and especially celebrating our Black queer, gender non-conforming and trans community of film filmmakers of all ethnicities and nationalities. With us tonight, we have Elegance Braden, Crystal Abeja, and Chester, and Joelle Faison. Thank you guys for joining. Um, Elegance Braden, the director of Peer Kids, began making films as a US Marine after a decade spent homeless. Today, he holds a BS from Columbia University and MFA from NYU Tisch Graduate Film. Walk For Me, it, his debut narrative short is about Hannah, a young trans girl whose secret life is discovered by her mother at a gay ball. The film played in over a hundred festivals worldwide, including winning best student short at the New Hampshire, best LGBT short at Ann Arbor Film Festival, best LGBT short Columbus Film Festival and Best Short at the Austin Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, amongst many other awards. His documentary uh, feature Pure Kids follows three queer and trans homeless youth on NYC's iconic Christopher Street Pier to show the intricate ways queer people of color utilize public space to hold cho chosen family. With Peer Kids, Elegance is the winner of Best Documentary Feature for All Gender Lifestyles and Identity Film Festival. Emerging Talent for Outfest 2019, Documentary Feature and Honorable Mention at the New Orleans Film Festival. He is the executive producer, creator of Viceland's GLAD nominated and Cannes MIPCOM winning series, My House. The inspection his forthcoming feature narrative script is supported by Tribeca All Access and Film Independent Fast Track and Producing Labs. He is one of IndieWire's 25 LGBT faces to watch and the winner of the Mayor Biggers Artist Fund Grant. Buck, his most recent short, had its world premiere at Sundance. We also have Chester Algernon in 2019, Chester became the first gender non-binary African-American costume designer to complete in competition at Cannes Film Festival with Port Authority. In the last four years, they've produced a fleet of acclaimed short films and a feature documentary called Peer Kids. Gordon was also a winner of the Tribeca Film Festival, Film Institute 2019, TFI, All Access Grant, and TFI Pond Five program. Gordon is a film independent 2019 producing lab and fast track lab fellow. Gordon's films have been official selection and won many awards in over 200 festivals combined, including Sundance, BFI, Outfest, New Orleans, Cleveland, Athens, Palm Springs, Black Star, and the American Black Film Festival. They're also producer for the MIPCOM 
2018 winner, Glad nominated documentary series, My House on Viceland. Gordon's latest shorts, Buck and Ship, are Sundance Films Festival's 2020 world premieres. We also have Crystal LaBeja, a public figure who's made appearances from BET to the Tamron Hall Show, a wife, activist, producer, performer, member of the Hall of Fame and first house of the ballroom culture, Royal House of LaBeja. Crystal is passionate about empowering the trans GNC community, the media and visual arts. Her life's work is to continue striving towards inspiring unity between mainstream society and the TGNC community. She intends to run for city council one day to make a difference. And hailing from Baltimore, Joelle Faison of Black Butterfly, who, will be, who we will be speaking to um, soon. Uh, currently attending college, majoring in film production, she has aspirations of becoming a director and creating stories for people who don't get to be seen on screen. So thank you guys for coming. Thank so Thanks for having us. <laughs> I'll be jumping right into questions, and afterwards, um, we'll be open to questions from the audience. Um, I, I wanted to start with elegance. Um, your film, uh, to me, identifies uh, the pu the publicness of Black queer life when highly visible. Times have changed since the making of this film, but the conditions of, of, of Black queer folk remain. What narratives of Black queer communities would you capture today in 2020? Oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm in the midst of capturing them as we speak. I have a show in development about the OnlyFans revolution, the subscription porn revolution that's going on. I have a movie that's about the inspection it's about a homeless kid who joins the Marine Corps to change his life, but then ends up falling for his drill instructor and having to hide it during boot camp. It's set during the last hotel. I have um, uh, a TV show based off of the short film that played Sundance this year called Buck that's also in development. It's about a queer Black youth who deals with depression and is trying to figure out whether or not he cares if he becomes HIV positive. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I guess when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm really interested in telling the stories of uh, outsiders, people for whom citizenship in this country isn't necessarily promised. So they have to, mm. ways to be, to be seen and to be held and at times invent ways to overcome systems that ignore them. So I, that's kind of my life work. So, yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm in the middle of making a lot more stuff. That's now. that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> you have a full plate. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm still hungry though. They're still hungry. <laughs> there's still there's still a lot of stories to tell. Sure. Um, uh, what black queer narratives uh, do you feel need more visibility specifically, or do you feel um, that have yet to be told that you that are in the background that you just I mean, amongst all of the films that you're already um, dedicated to, do you do you think that there's something that you can't necessarily approach or or haven't been able to that you're interested in? I think I think we need more black trans and black film stories. Yeah, I think that we have a lot of like black female and a lot of like we don't have a lot of lesbian stories, but we do have some. You know, they've been represented in the media. But I do think we need more lesbian stories as well. I think that a lot of representation is lacking around uh, female femmes and, you know, women, African-American women in sure. on television um, sure. where they are not heteronormative, but they're lesbians or things outside, even bisexual, things outside, and real, really bisexual, you know? And not that they're not really bisexual, that they're straight, you know, in the narrative that's given. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Actually, speak on that. Um, yeah. Like, we but, need more Black women and more Black femmes, more Black trans women. We need all of that representation that we don't have in the industry. How do you, how do you, how does that, that makes me think of like um, a lot, there's a lot of, uh, crowd uh, funding, crowdsourcing around um, getting production for 
Black trans women to tell their stories. Um, uh, how ha, have you have you have have there been any films that you've seen that kind of like bring to mind that you'd kind of want to see more uh, Black trans women? Yes, tell the story I, and I, we were part of producing. Uh, Fatima Jamal. Yes. So, love that. Best. Love that. That's um, beautiful. Um, yeah. And um, follow Fat Fem, y'all. Yeah. There's a bunch of other, you know, there's, a, there's just there's so many people, there's so many trans women and mm. people who have not had a traditional education in making films who right. think that, you know, they need they need institutional support and they need support from people who do have experience making films and telling their stories too. So I think that you know there there needs to be a, a, a intersection where everything meets. You know, like the the professional film industry and people who want to get into pro professional film industry and the mentorship thing that happens. That 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 that's a lot because so much of. Of, of 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 the narrative of trans women is is so in real time and it's like there's like this gap between survival and then like then like telling your story that you've been surviving so no but yeah uh, elegance were you gonna say something oh I was well I was gonna say a couple of things I was gonna say like you know um, I think uh, I think people need to be a lot more like for me as a filmmaker, it's tough because it's like, it's true. I've had a lot of support and a lot of mentorship. A lot of people, you know, who are in really incredible positions within the industry have looked out for me and given me counsel. At the same time, I would never have met those people if I didn't go out to Christopher Street every day for five years with the money that I had to make a story, you know? So I think it it's a mission, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. I think people need to push their way into the door so that they can be seen. And I think that people also need to be leaving their ivory towers and finding where the people are at. And hopefully if both sides are doing that, you'll see a lot more representation. Yeah. You know? yeah. She was a maker of things too. She's a, a producer in her own right. So there's yeah. progress right in this room. There's, a, there's of course, Crystal. Most definitely. Crystal, what, um, what kind of stories are are you anticipating to tell? Well, um, um, I know with La Beja's right now, we're, we actually have a production uh, attached to our, um, our LLC. And so our goal is to drive our narrative and control the narrative of ballroom and how it's presented how it's presented. I know mm -hmm. it's going more mainstream with legendary polls and things like Elegance's show my house and stuff. Um, so our goal is just to make sure that um, as we continue to gain mainstream notoriety, that the elements that made ballroom strong and important mm -hmm. for several un ostracized kids in the world, um, that 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 nature of community mm -hmm. stands, and I think the only way that we can kind of help push that it's more than just a competition, it's more than the glamour, is by having more control over the types of narratives that we project, and as well as like we have a lot of icons within the community that has made it past the expectancy age of 34. So therefore we want to, we, uh, one of the projects we're working on is trying to bring attention to those who are living and protesting through their livelihoods. I actually be a functional and successful individuals in society and thriving as uh, women who happen to be of trans experience. And so um, that's a, a series that we're hoping to get out there and picked up. But one of the roadblocks that, that, that was mentioned before is that, okay, what makes them special, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's, that's interesting. <laughs> It, it, it it's like what relationships um like to 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 power i like i i kind of want to see a lot of that is that narrative of like um really of 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 public displays of power by um you know black trans women um gender nonconforming mean people in public space and 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 kind of 
like what what you know from that perspective like where where does she gain her her vigor her rigor you know yeah that to, grit to that still, grit to at the end of the day through. still go through it yeah yeah definitely. yeah, yeah. And, and, and oftentimes when you're pitching these shows that's the roadblock we get they're like okay well women go through struggles there are some people that are has-beens or that hasn't made it in the industry or that hasn't made it to a respective space in their uh in their fields so what makes it special and then they say we don't want it to just be a trans story unless it has drama or it has hardships all wrapped up in it. But then we become nothing more than the hard times we have in our lives. Exactly. So, that yeah. is that is kind of like what I'm just I, I'm yeah I'm interested in seeing what representations of of power um for sure and and privilege that uh black trans women hold and then i think um, we'll have more progress mm -hmm. we won't i think i think so, be yeah. cornered into certain roles to where like i'm sorry i don't want to just see myself playing a trans individual i was an actor before so like give me a role but then the inclusivity in the industry is very far off mm. so it's where okay you have you have the the chops to get the spot but will the cast members appear or where our sponsors and producers support the project because of your um, not outness in the project. So it's like now you're pigeonholed to just playing your own story and that's triggering in itself. Like I made it through that portion of my life. Now I have to only play these roles that mirror things I've made it through. It's like, yeah. It's, it's yeah. A thing to be in part of. Yeah. I, 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 it, I think that um, sometimes I think about the um, as trans and, and, and gender nonconforming people and queer people and black people that we um, sometimes always have to navigate um, advocating for ourselves within the process of production and and how how like what's been your experience, Crystal, doing that um, as you like as you produce um, like. What's been what's been some of the roadblocks? Um, well, as mentioned before, that that's one of the main ones, just because they don't see the importance in what I feel should be projected on screen. You know, um, right now they they want what the first. They say they don't want too much drama, but if it's a trans story, we want to see your transition. We want to see the hardships that you mm -hmm. face through transition. Um, and then if it's not, um, if they want to reject it, the first thing they say is that what's special about it as well as um, does it, we don't want to be, we just don't, uh, our audience may not be ready for a trans no, story. Right, we that don't one. Jump on the trans um, bandwagon. One. And so th those are the things that we've been facing when it comes to, or we have our trans project. We don't need another one in our lineup. And so. Yeah, that, that um, what r reminds me about um, your story and Pure Kids uh, was the relationship to your mother, which was, um, a narrative that holds a sense. I, at least, at least for me, it was it was triggering um, as a black trans woman, and to see that kind of exchange. Um, I, I I question like how has your relationship to your mom changed, and and furthermore, how has the relationship to your mother influenced your pathways? To, to motherhood within your own community and your children? Well, um, honestly, I wouldn't know how to make a budget, <laughs> a governmental budget to feed a house full of individuals um, every weekend or just who needs a place to stay without having that example uh, presented from my parents who would let anyone who had a bad household or just needed some support during the summertime or whatever come stay with her. Um, so I think that that nurturing spirit, I did get that from my mother, but at the same sense, um, 
our relationship now, it took her seeing the interaction between me and my nieces and my nephews and the acceptance of my brothers um, when she would come visit them and I would be in the midst. It, she didn't want to skew how my nieces and nephews saw me, mm. their auntie. And so I think that's what helped bring her along more when she got out of the Bible Belt of influences. Um, and now we FaceTime, we talk to each other all the time. Every time she comes to Pennsylvania and everything, we see each other constantly. She acknowledges my husband, my marriage. It's been six years, she has to. Um, so it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so far, I mean, everything's been on the up and up uh, since then. That's so much strength. Girl, you have so, so much strength. That's beautiful. The strength, the strength to hold that all through. Um, I, and and as beautifully as uh, Peer Kids depicted, like your personal life at that time, were there any parts uh, that that you wish were highlighted more, or that for that time period, looking back? Um, there's, I mean, I guess there's some moments where like I went to Atlanta to, mm -hmm. to do the awards ball and I won grand prize. Um, and that was like my first time walking in Atlanta as a La Beja. So I, yeah. I would have enjoyed seeing that. Um, there was some other things that just couldn't make it because of the time strengths mm -hmm. of the recording, such as me going through my procedure. Actually, I didn't get the vote because um, I was uh, going through my SRS procedure. So, um, and my breast augmentation. So it's like, yeah, I think those those are pivotal moments that I I was hoping that ki uh, kids other places from the rural places like Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas, Alabama, and stuff like that can know that there's a uh, if they keep pressing towards the mark, you can change your stars, you can reach that goal. Just continue to pray, have faith, and move forward, um, and That's you can good. reach it. And so those those are only elements that I feel. Um, I wish would have made it, but at the same sense, we having it's, a conversation now. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah it's beautiful. <laughs> no, we're having a conversation now, and that's why, um, you know, because I, I when I when I was I was at the piers probably, uh, yeah, right right before that they did that remodeling of the pier, you know, um, yeah. like twenty twenty, like what was that? Oh, oh, nine, ten, two thousand. Yeah, somewhere around that area. Yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> right before, so I came back from Chicago one summer, and I saw that that was all, all just changed up. And then you kind of like you get a little worried as to, uh -huh. as, to as to you know where where did everyone go and like are they still here? And yeah. um, because because the lives that in, inhabit that space were so transient, um, you kind of. You're like, why? How? Where? Where are? How are people still coming here? And and who has like stayed within the community and who has left? Um, how how do you keep in contact with, or, or do you? Or how how does how, how do you keep in contact with the peer? What's your relationship with the peer nowadays? Well, it's still more of a check in. Like for me, uh, mm -hmm. when I met Elegance, it was more so. I used to go there for spades. Tuesday, uh, Wednesdays and Sundays was my karaoke day at Boots and Saddles. So it was more so I would be out there, and, you know, on the weekends, I'm playing spades after a doctor's appointment until karaoke. So that was always more so. And then after balls, that was just like the iconic way back from where they held the latex ball. You just walk down the pier until you get to Christopher Street. So for me, it was more nostalgic. And um, if if there's kids that wanted to go gather amongst a community that accepted them where they can be free um, and unjudged, then I would go down there with them. I still like to go down there periodically just to check on the ones that I feel will still be there. Mm -hmm. um, due to them just being there for so long, I don't, uh, you know, sometimes that that's no different than somebody uh, in the VA or someone who's just ha been isolated from shelters. When you have to deal with so many uncontrollable situations in shelters because the conditions are horrible, um, sometimes you just get comfortable with being free. 
and mm, um, mm. and I think that's why some it's so uh, it's a calling. Do I deal with the eight the curfew? Do I deal with the the shaming or the the discrimination at these places that they barely have a cot at, or do I stay out there all night long, get a little bit of money, and then go home? Uh, uh, well, or walk go to the next program that's also in that Manhattan area. Mm. And my thing is, if they want people not to be there so much, they just need to have better support in the boroughs where they put the projects at. Um, but all the money is in Manhattan. So mm. that's where the kids stay because that's where all the programming is and all the money that's raised goes to the middle-class white organizations down in Manhattan. Right. So. <laughs> the, the, that's, see, I, I, I'm, I'm like black trans women and gender non-conforming people and queer people and black people have such an awareness of, of, of like the funneling of like resources and like who's, you know, who gets what, when, and where. And, um, and I, and I, for the longest, I think I also struggled, struggled with that idea of like just understanding where the money went and, and also having so much freedom, um, in being in transit or like in, in this transient state um, and, and having such a wide focus on, on society at large that you're essentially trying to navigate. Um, do you feel that that also heightens one's survival instincts and, and means to organize now? I'm not sure if I understand the question in full, um, but I, what I can say is that in terms of, you know, how do you keep up with people and the allocation of resources, you know, I do think that all over America, especially in cities with a shoreline, with like a riverfront, there's been a move to gentrify and to monetize those spaces, those that real estate that's near the water, right? Mm -hmm. And in New York City, the pier itself has been a queer queers of color, black queer meeting space since at least the 1920s, right? So, and, and really even before that, like before there was even a word for homosexual or, you know, transgender or any of that, when, it, when they had no way of, the, of defining or labeling um, our identities, the cops would write about, and it's like in the 1800s, they were right about going to the pier and mm -hmm. seeing called fairies, you know, men that they said dressed as women and, you know, perverts and inverts and all these other psychological terms that are way before even, you know, the 1920s. So on some level, right, these types of spaces have always drawn, like if you're, if you're from an, out, a, an outsider point of view and you need to get resources immediately, one of the best places to go is the port. Because if you go to the port, there's a lot of exchange going on, right. a lot of money changing hands. There's a lot of opportunities for, for solving issues. So when we think about the word gentrification, I think we also need to be thinking about how that word is a code word for ethnic cleansing, how that word gentrification really is about the valuation of property and the devaluation of certain people. And you know, these kids on the pier, this is one of the reasons why I kind of I had to tell the story. Because, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, queer black resilience in the face of oppression, but it's very rare that we really consider what forces people are up against. Like, you know, to Crystal's earlier point, this idea of like the trans story where the struggle is like in you, right? Somehow it's, it's, it's endemic to one's being, one's physical self. In reality, in the world of gentrification, right? The struggle is against multi-billion dollar corporation. Right. The struggle is against, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars pumped into the New York police force to make them into a militarized um, entity. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you maintain, how do you maintain a presence in a space with all of this industry against you on one side and then on the nonprofit side, yes, we can talk about the allocation of resources and programs, but let's not pretend that these programs did not come about like that there isn't yeah. like a like we, yeah. there's a lot of stuff to be saying about trauma porn, right? And documentary. Trauma porn. Mm -hmm. right? But nobody talks about the nonprofit industrial complex 
ever since HIV and AIDS becomes a predominantly black disease, right? There becomes now a cash cow in this, in the perpetual victimhood of queer people, black queer people, queer people of color, in that these nonprofits, as valuable as they are, I'm not saying they should not be there, but I think that there is a time now for a more engaged and meaningful anti-capitalist critique of these institutions and their ability now to protect black trans lives. I just want to add something to two things. Yeah. People to me that on two of your points, one point is the kids are Christopher Street. I think that Christopher Street, like Warhol talked about a social network, right? Uh, we have like how social life had a social network. I think uh, LGBT trans youth have always had a social network and we've always kept each other in our social networks and like how we all know each other, right? how we know each other, but we know each other because a lot of our friends are the same people mm-hmm. and we get a lot of the same information. You know, we're applying to a lot of the same grants. We're applying to a lot of the same uh, uh, things in order to, you know, going through a lot of the same systems, you know? Uh, the industrial, this nonprofit industrial complex that's very similar to the prison industrial complex. Because once something works, and once you start to commodify and make money off of people a certain way, then the government and society continues to make money off of people that way. So, you know, how money is made off of AIDS or HIV, you know? Right, uh, right. You, you make a certain amount of money off of a person because of what they're, the services that they're getting from the state that has to be paid for by somebody, essentially. Right. That that's that and that's a, a lot to hold. That's a lot to hold in in our bodies, right? Being being affected by by that whole system. Um, I wanted to uh, jump into at this moment a black butterfly uh, by Joel, and um, it was such a beautiful, such a beautiful, uh, intimate film. I felt. Uh, by way of the perspective uh, that the film was shot and and the way in which um, there was there was no uh, uh, essentially monologues or scripts that 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 were about character development in a traditional way. Um, what? What inspired you to to take in, you know, into into this, like, you know, take that discourse of that narrative and display it that way? Um, it was so long ago when we um made it. Um, I don't. I think we didn't go the verbal route. I don't even think we really like. I don't think we ever like really like thought about mm-hmm. making a script. It's just it was just like so, like the premise and stuff. It just felt like you know words didn't really need to be needed, right. honestly. Right. Um, That's beautiful. That um, where where so that was shot in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. That was a school in that space. Were you like familiar with that space also? Uh. Yeah, for the school scenes that were shot in the school, I believe um, one of the students, a part of the after school program, Wide Angle, that was their school. And I think they asked permission for us to um, go there um, and film around in there. How, how has the film changed for you, things as far as like making more films and? Um, it definitely made me feel, you know, accomplished, you know, being able to like have this idea and then it be like actually brought to life. And it makes me excited to do more. Um, currently though, since I am a student, I'm just like sticking with that. Um, and just trying to honestly just get through life and like work and stuff. Mm, yeah, yeah. For sure, I'm 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 still there. <laughs> We're all still there, definitely. Um, are are there any projects that you wish to see that um from you? Like, are there any narratives that you have 
you've been working on? Um, well, there is like this idea, this reoccurring idea that I constantly have um, between, it's like with this relationship between like daughter and mother, yeah. um, it, it mainly is influenced and reflects like um, the relationship that I have and the issues that I've been through with my mother. Um, and I just constantly have that idea. I don't really know how to like write That's screenplays beautiful. and scripts yet. I'm learning. So once I learn, I hope to maybe start on it. That's beautiful. Um, uh, elegance. I, that kind of, that kind of um, brings me to a question around well, communities that hold like the intimacy between um, generations, is that something that you think about um, when approaching your work as far as uh, documentary making? Uh, it's something I think about in all of my work. You know, I do docs, I do narrative, um, I do television, I do film. Um, I think uh, I think one of the the kind of unique historical conditions of being black is the the fact that you have a system that seems to be obsessed, singularly concerned with breaking apart your community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Your immediate mother, father, brother, sister, cousin, right? Whatever, child, or whether that's your community on a pier in New York City where you get to go and play spades and you know, mm. talk, talk trash, right. what have you, right? So for me, I think it's really important that the generations like share knowledge with one another, um, yeah. especially in queer spaces. Like, you know, we've had a really horrible time of it with HIV. You right. Know, a lot of people have died um, early, young. A lot of people who, if they had lived, possibly would have spread, you know, messages down to the next generation yeah. that could have helped us avoid Trump, right. could have helped right. us do all sorts of things oh, better. You know? <laughs> so, so yeah, it's important to me that community, that the intimacy between community, that older people speak to younger people, that trans people speak to cis people, that black people speak to white people. That's, and, yeah. It's a it's a big part of what I do. It's 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 I I, I see it. I, I'm I'm always um like wondering uh like when when approaching either you know recreating these narratives or capturing them in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, what is off limits uh, as far as like what like you know what is too too future to tell and you know of a story or is it or or you know because i feel like there's a lot of um a lot of there's like a, a lot more platforms for stories that already have been told as mm. opposed to the introduction of a new story mm. um and how to how do you know when you're not going to tell a story I, I typically just listen to, first I listen to my, my intuition when it comes to, I think, I think artists are only as good as their instincts. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I've gone to art school, you know, um, I appreciated my time in art school, but at the end of the day, art school can't teach you how to be an artist. What, what makes you an artist is your instincts, is the feelings. And most people in day-to-day -day life, they kind of try to turn their feelings down so they can get through life. Whereas I think artists are it's the opposite you turn those emotions up so that other people can see it in themselves and hopefully see themselves in your work and, and they're compelled by it. And they, because they're compelled, because, you know, everyone's a little self, you know, um, but, uh, no, really, you know, but I, I think yeah. about your intuition. I, for me, I tell stories that I can't live without. I tell stories that keep me up at night. I tell stories that make me uncomfortable. I tell stories that make me laugh. I tell stories that make me cry. If I am emotionally drawn to the material, that is the story that I have to tell. And once I'm in that place, then I feel I have a responsibility 
to place the audience within the head of the of whomever the story is about so that they can feel and breathe in the skin of another and hopefully learn something better about the world and to take that to walk outside of my work into their day-to-day -day lives with a lesson learned and a new way of seeing that makes the world a better place so I, to me there are no limits. That, that, that that that's a good question because i mean that's a good answer because i was thinking about how do you how far away is your work from your intimacy like you're in your own like right there <laughs> right there Exactly. <laughs> that's that. I mean, you know, that's, that's the beauty of, of go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, Chris, uh, okay. uh, when you were talking about intergenerational, uh, like storylines and mm -hmm. stuff before that, that just in my heart, I was like, um, that's what they, and then he was talking about the eighties and the whole AIDS epidemic. Um, that's one of the re main reasons why I wanted to join the House of Labasia over 10 years ago was because mm -hmm. um, they still have a lot of pioneers like Junior, Chris, Derek, both Derek's, Freddie, and a lot of other people that, and Tommy, and that, that made it through those times. Not to, and, and it's 52 years old and counting. It's like, for me, it was important to be a part of something that goes through the times that shows that we had a community that has a strong, uh, that has a strong core, a strong origin, and that branches out to other long lasting uh, houses like uh, Ebony, St. Lawrence, and the list goes on. Right. Line, Ms. Rice. And so it's like, it, it, and it's, it, it's, a, it's not just here, it's teaching other countries and other states how to form a community mm -hmm. and a support system. And it was before nonprofits told us we had to. It was yeah. it was something it was a structure that we could rely on. It was a resource that when I was traveling from Arizona to Vegas to Kansas City to St. Louis to Philly up to West New York down to New York it there was always ballroom and a sense of community outside of the white clubs if there were no place for us to join. So it's like, it's I felt like- our own network, our own exactly. social network. And it, it, it's been here That's since beautiful. 52 years, uh, 52 years and more uh, before. We can just count ballroom and as we know it today, 52 years in the house structure system. But as far wow. as the community, it's been here. And I think it's uh, important to, I just wanted to show, to, to mention that because that intergenerational communication does take place by your mothers, by the godparents, mm -hmm. by the mm -hmm. overall, and, and, and the nonprofits are kind of, kind of, uh, pulling that apart because with the Kiki scene and with all of these other entities that's, you know, finding a cash crop in our community, it's more so where um, the kids doesn't don't have to rely on their mentors anymore. They don't have to rely on their parents or their elders yeah. because there's a nonprofit, there's a grand prize at the nonprofit. There's yeah. a program at the nonprofit, but the programs aren't really reliant on giving you education yeah or giving you diploma diplomacy they they may give you training in something that may not be productive outside that nonprofit or you could take an internship to be a volunteer but it's not really core things yeah that, can, that you can use in the world and I think that like you said reconstruct we're reconstructing the police force we need to reconstruct the, the nonprofits that say they're there to help our community no, also, to add to what you're saying, Crystal, another amazing thing to me is that the ballroom scene and the these, uh, the subculture has been able to create an economy of their own, to of their own exactly, exactly. Been able to function. Like you know, as far as like you know, selling tickets to balls, you know, selling um, what is it like food and stuff at these balls and drinks mm -hmm. and all that stuff, mm -hmm. like money that's being transferred within a community, you know, too. That's yeah. that's that's a whole economy. Somewhere the whole, the whole the Mormons in the second lines, you know. Right, right, right. Very like, similar. Made up, you know, to some degree, or like a football game. How much money do you think is traded at these high school football games with these vendors? I mean, so. colleges wouldn't exist right now. Yeah. Right? That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> They're going out of business because of Corona. Because of Corona, you know. <laughs> 
Um, but um, I would like to open up, uh, you know, some questions from our audience. Um, so I'm gonna see what they have. Um, I think there's a question. Yeah, Ooh. I am ready for the next question. Okay, Nia, Nia Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Elegance, do you have any filmmaker oh. advice? For I see it now. Uh, no worries. Um, my advice to Joelle. Well, I think, um, I think, well, I, well, first of all, congratulations on your film. Every Thank movie, you. You're welcome. Every movie is a miracle. So, Anytime you get to say it's a wrap and it goes out into a world, you won. Um, my advice to you, I don't know, what do you want to know? I, I, I could give you a few different things. If you want creative, I can give you creative. If you want professional, you professional. Obviously, you could contact me after if you really want to uh -huh. talk turkey, we can do that. But um, you don't know. <laughs> it's gorgeous. Um, I guess if it makes sense, just like how to like actually just go and do it. Cause I feel like I'm just still so wrapped up in my own mind, you know, cause like I have an idea and I wanna like, you know, get it started. But then I just like, I'm like, well, I'm not good at this. Or what if like yeah. no one wants to look at it? And then like, you know, I just like leave it alone. Right. Well, you answered your own question. That's why you're not getting anything done. <laughs> because you keep thinking about what people are going to say instead of thinking about what it is that you have to say. You know, I think um, I always kind of think about really, really good art making. Like I, I find inspiration from like the most basic stuff, right? I'm in, New, I'm in New York, you're on the train and everybody's wrapped up in their cell phones, right? And all of a sudden someone gets on the train and they start yelling or they start dancing or they start speaking loudly and everyone is out of their cell phones and interested in what they're doing. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that person feels like they have something that they need to say and that everyone needs to hear. Mm -hmm. and if you speak up, people are going to listen. They you still, know? They're still the same. You know? like there's yeah. people the subway, by the way, who can't handle for money. Mm -hmm. And there's a person who comes on after the person and will steal the money from the other person yeah. in New York City, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so like, so like, <laughs> that's the first thing. Not know that. Believe, in <laughs> believe that you have something to say, and believe in it. You know, that's the first thing. And then secondly, prepare, 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 prepare. Consume the work. Like one of my favorite movies, that like my movie. I can't get into too many details, but my my fiction film that's coming out. We have two really big producers. I guess one of them I can say is Effie Brown. I don't know if y'all y'all ever saw Dear White People. She's a producer. Obviously, my bae is a producer as well. Um, and then the other, I can't say. But what I can say is, is that the movies that influence the inspection are Full Metal Jacket, Bo Trevi, Moonlight, and um, Jarhead. These are films I've watched probably a hundred times a piece. I'm so obsessed with learning how to do how how to make my version of those films that at times, this one will tell you. I would actually just write, rewrite the script as it's said on screen. Anything to understand how these things that I admire work on a molecular level. And after a certain while of doing it, you start to pick up the skills of the things that you're actually consuming. Yeah. And for a while, you're like, you know what? I have this idea. Let me sit down and let me outline it. Because now, you've, now that you've done that kind of work, you know what a film outline is. So my advice to you would be, you know, the easiest way to get out of your own way is to get out of your way and just make stuff without caring what people think. And secondly, the stuff that you love, the stuff that keeps you up at night, the stuff that you're like, how does she write that? How does she make me feel this? When I, I don't even care about Eskimos. And all of a sudden I care about Eskimos. Break that movie down, element for element, page for page, word for word. And I promise you on the other end of that, you'll be a better writer. And only want to be like yourself. We can't be like anything but ourselves. Like it's nice to admire people and admire their careers, but you have to realize that your career will never be like anybody else's career because of the path that, you know, this thing that we're living called life, nobody's living it your life except for you, which means that your path is specifically for you. You know what I'm saying? So you can't, so like, mm -hmm. like I always tell when my people ask me, how do I uh, get into, film, into the film industry? I always say, you know, why don't you tell a story that only you can tell? 
You know, that's the other piece. The only tell a story that only yeah. you can tell yeah. that's very personal yeah. to you. Yeah. Because that's how you start aesthetics. That's how you start to, you know, form stuff like that. And I think that, you know, that's what you should and do. I, and I think directors, I'm a know-it-all. I want to know everything. I read art books. I read history books. I read science books. I read articles. I read blogs. I read Instagrams. <laughs> so I'm constantly engaged with filling myself up with the thing that inspires me. So that way when I sit down in front of that blank screen, that blank piece of paper, I'm not intimidated. And don't be afraid to fuck up. Yeah. It's okay. Mm, yeah. All the time, yeah. All the time, <laughs> like, you know, and it's okay. I stay it's okay. <laughs> it is okay because guess what? If Failing you, forward, you, okay. And you get to do it over and over and over yeah. again. And then right now you're in school and you're learning. This is the time. This, this is the like, time. This mm -hmm. is the time to do all those things. Like, all that. Like, when people say, I wish I had a year to research this movie. Girl, you have all the time in the world right now to research that yeah. feature that you really want to do once you come out of school. You have all the time to start putting that together. And it takes a long time to put together films. Yeah. It could take a year just to research a film before you even write the outline. If it's a, if it's a good film. If it's a yeah. good film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, I mean, there's so much more, but those, that's it, you know? I, um, one last question. I had, um, which was, uh, Elegance, has the movie facilitated any relationships with other queer and trans communities internationally? Yeah, yeah, we're playing, the film is playing, it so far has played in, it was playing in Ireland, Korea, South Korea. It's playing in South Korea in October. It's playing uh, in, um, playing it's in played the UK. UK. It's played at BFI. So it was playing again in the UK for the first time because it was it was supposed to play a BFI player, but it got canceled because of Corona. Yeah. So now it's playing at their at this other big festival that they have. Take there. one action. Yeah, take one action um, festival. We're yeah, I have but most importantly, we're talking to people like at all these festivals that we go to locally in our own country, we're talking to people that we normally wouldn't talk to, who wouldn't be able to see this. Like for instance, here at Femme Supremacy, we're talking to now Films and trans women in Baltimore. And we're talking to the LGBT community in Baltimore. And I think that it's important that we talk to people in our own backyard so we fix the problems that's here at home internally within our own communities. And, and you know, I mean, that's what's most, most important. I think. Well, that's the thing about our, about our beautiful struggle as Black people. It's inspirational to the entire planet. Everywhere in the world where people are, are oppressed, they look at the example of Black Americans to learn how to persevere and how to overcome. If you look at the fact that slavery ended like 160 years ago, and here we are with black presidents and first ladies and billionaires, and not to say that capitalism is perfect, but it is to say that we are an inspirational people. So whenever we tell our stories, the whole world listens because everyone's trying to figure out how yeah. to shake this beast off of their back. Yeah, it also just made me think about Crystal, by the way, what she said earlier about when you asked her the question of what, uh, what she will want people to see that they didn't see. Mm -hmm. The fact that she can answer that question, it says so much about her time that she's given to the world already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So seriously, the fact that like, the fact that kids can look at her and say, wow, I, if, if my parent kicks me out, at least I know I can go to this place and get services or get help if I stick behind it and I can be the person who I want to be eventually. And I think that like, you know, that inspiration, I mean, that's priceless. Like, you know, that is priceless. If you had a person with you when you were, if you had somebody who could say at 10 years old, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Like, you don't you don't understand it right now in this moment. But right. in five years, and you like, will. Yeah. You, you what? Be that girl. <laughs> we have one more question. It says, What's Joel's dream film idea? Yes. Oh, <laughs> not to put you on the spot like that, but <laughs> who is this like Nia? old person? Yeah, no, I know that was Nia. Yeah, I know. I'm being funny. Oh. <laughs> like what I what's my what I would like to make as a film, like dream, like yeah, that like dream, like something that just kind of echoes in your head, like yeah, you just like, oh, I could never do that, but you know, one day. For now, I really think it's like this idea I keep having, you know, with the 
you know, relationship between a mother and daughter. For some reason, I don't know. I kind of want to do like maybe like a horror or thriller aspect to it. To oh, that's that. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Yeah. That would be. Yeah, that Ooh, would be I film my feet, film dream <laughs> yes, too. <laughs> you know, okay, so uh, I actually told Elegance this as we were filming. Um, one of my f uh, one of my favorite, um, he went to Thailand before. I want to go to Thailand. And because of their culture um, about the third gender or eunuchs mm -hmm. or what we call women of trans experience, um, a vampire movie about the goddesses of that culture and just you know a black american twist on it but i want it to be like a vampire type thriller type movie but wow. it's tied into that whole you the know thrillers. That yeah like, with the whole story, with the whole third gender hit really i'd watch that i'd watch that, I'd watch that. <laughs> I, I and if you and if you need any um, suggestions on Thailand, I got you. Like I, I'll write, I, I'll I'll write out a little itinerary because work out. You work out. Work out. <laughs> How about you? What's your favorite? I mean, what's Imani. your Imani? What's your dream uh, film idea? You know, it's um, that the the narrative between mother and daughter jo what Joelle was talking about I see your film Joe <laughs> actually so it's um I think that um systems of of the matriarch um you mm -hmm. know within the matriarchal systems I think we kind of have like um a long discussion, of, uh, we have a lot of discussions around patriarchy and like what are systems of, um, that uphold, you know, uh, masculine energies, but now what are, what are like how many ways can, can a matriarchal system, you know, mitigate and dismantle, you know, um, uh, what we, the current state that we're living in. So if there, you know, that too. I think the ballroom, like to a certain extent, the ballroom scene is kind of like a return to me. Like in my head, when I look at it, that's what I see. That's, that's what you see. You know, so I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I'd love to watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, a good yeah. question. I'm um, sorry. Yes, uh, we have. What have post screening discussions been like, particularly in communities where Crystal came from? where her mom was so adamantly against Crystal's gender identity. Hey B, hey B girl. Um, it's been, it, I mean, the thing about film festivals is that you're generally in the liberal pocket wherever the festival plays. So I can't say that it has been like super um, combative in any way, but what I think is happening around the country, I mean, with COVID and Breonna Taylor, and Black Lives Matter and, and this, this, this situation with Trump, I think everybody is looking for something that can give them that little extra dose of courage to fight for what's right against insurmountable odds. And Pure Kids is a movie filled with people who are fighting for love, fighting for family, and they're fighting against literally the most powerful police force in the world, the richest corporations on the planet and the most expensive city in the world as well. So I think when people watch this movie around the country and those places like the rural places like can't like Missouri and um, Iowa and all these other places that we played Milwaukee, I think they're going to this film and are coming out of this film ready to fight. Yeah, a lot of white people, a lot of white straight people, older people, like we had a screen in Milwaukee and a lot of people volunteered after that. Yeah, after right. and donated money. So, right. Uh, I just wanted to make one addition that will be long. Um, a quick response uh, to that. I, I will say that the auntie that you saw in the film, my her daughter, Rakisha, 
she reached out to one of my cousins uh, uh, in Ohio. And although they may not acknowledge me face to face because I'm not living in Kansas City, they reached out to uh, her and told her to reach out to me to help with her transition just so that she wouldn't feel like she was alone because there was nobody in Ohio. So I will say there is progress in the sense of that area because they now have someone to appoint them to. So. That's how it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. And any, of you, any of you have film ideas, you can throw them my way and I will produce them for you. So just where can we find what's your what's your handle? What's your IG handle? Oh, my IG handle is our journal, but you can find any of us through Peer Kids. Like Crystal's tagged in all the photos, I'm tagged in all the photos, Elegance is tagged in all the photos. Peer Kids on any platform. Thank you can find us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much um, for joining in this discussion. Um, until the next film. <laughs> yes. And donate to Film Supremacy Film Festival so we have spaces like this for films, Black women and trans women to keep their story, keep telling their stories and have a platform for the world to see them and for there to be a safe space to have these discussions. So please yes. donate to me as possible because it, it needs to be around. Baltimore needs this. Yes. Baltimore needs this. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.